Thank you, Sherry. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to spend a few minutes with you and, and uh, um, tell you a little bit about why I, uh, I'm here, why I came, uh, what's exciting me about the School of Engineering, and, uh, and of course, to introduce our, our wonderful speaker. Um, a number of people asked me why I came, why, why Rachel and I moved, uh, moved from London and, uh, and came here. Obviously, it's beautiful. <laughs> Obviously, we're trying to get away from the rain. <laughs> sort of, sort of, uh, tried, <laughs> didn't succeed. People tell me this is unusual, and uh, I'm, I can only believe them, so <laughs> we'll see. But no, I, I, the real reason is that the, the engineering school here is uh, really uniquely positioned for 21st century engineering, and, and engineering that is uh, solving real-world problems. Um, interesting for me, being at Imperial College, Imperial was created out of a, uh, a surplus that came from the Great Expedi Expedition in uh, 1851. So the Great Ex Exposition, Exposition actually, and not an ex expedition, an exhibition. Um, the, this exhibition, of course, was a way of introducing uh, engineering to the UK, and Prince Albert decided to have this big event with the Crystal Palace in uh, Hyde Park. And uh, this thing ran a surplus. And with the surplus, he was able to um, create a, a college that was dedicated to engineering and, and science and the intersection of engineering and science. And interestingly, what happened after that was a, um, a medical school was added. So this institution, which combined science and engineering and medicine, was as an experience for me that I, I think was uh, quite transformative. And I think that's part of what's, what's appealing here in, uh, in Santa Cruz. Uh, we don't have a medical school, and, and David uh, likes to tell me about why that's a big advantage, and I think he's, <laughs> he's really, really convinced me about that. And I'll, I'll, say, I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, so this, this engineering school we have uh, as I said, is really shaped for the 21st century. And what I've been saying to people is that it's, it's not 19th century engineering. And if I think about the 1851 uh, exhibition and what that led to at Imperial College, it led to very traditional 19th century engineering, uh, you know, mechanical engineering and civil engineering and chemical engineering. Where uh, BSOE came from was really the, the world of the internet. And it's 20 years old, and it, as we like to say, it grew up and is growing up with the internet age. Uh, so our, um, our focus really is in things around computation, around um, the, inter the intersection of engineering and medicine, life, health, and uh, these sorts of societal issues that are really underlie Santa Cruz and what Santa Cruz stands for. Santa Cruz the community and Santa Cruz the university. So for me, this was a very uh, appealing, appealing place to work, to lead, and to live. So we are, we are growing incredibly. Um, and uh, obviously this is creating some interesting tensions within the university within Santa Cruz. Uh, engineering is exploding. Last, this year, this academic year, engineering grew 35% in undergraduate population year over year. Uh, it grew 60% year over year in graduate population. So we are really, really exploding. And uh, we currently have about 22 or so percent of the undergraduates about 32% of the graduate students on campus. And those numbers are just continuing to grow. And so um, Sherry mentioned we have a record number of undergraduate applications. Um, so many of these students are interested in getting involved in engineering. And these are students who obviously have opportunities in many places. Uh, but what Santa Cruz offers, again, is this opportunity to uh, impact society to, to do social good 
uh, to work on problems around sustainability, health, life, and, um, and really the betterment of society. And I think that's really important and distinguishing uh, for, for us. Now, the graduates, of course, um, have had a big uh, impact on, on our local community here. One of the interesting facts about Santa Cruz graduates is that they tend to cluster around here. I was told, OK, as dean, you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to visit the graduates. And if you talk to other deans around the country, they spend their time flying around the country. And uh, we don't really have to do that, because our graduates tend to stay in, in Santa Cruz, stay in the Bay Area, stay somewhere around here because there's, again, so much opportunity in this area and uh, they, see, they see the benefit of being here and, and growing their ideas in the local community. So we have uh, a number of, of distinguished alumni who've, who've been doing that. I think you're, uh, you might be aware of uh, Sarah Eisenberg, who's one of our graduates. She is uh, the person behind Santa Cruz Tech Beat, uh, a great friend of um, of the engineering school. Uh, Doug Erickson, who has created the uh, tech meetup, which I had the pleasure of attending. Uh, it's an incredibly exciting, exciting place. You know, 300 or so uh, tech entrepreneurs all getting together to share and share their experiences and, and uh, talk about how to bring real innovation and economic development to, um, to Santa Cruz and the Santa Cruz area. Uh, our alum, alumni are also part of just the local tech scene as, as employees, of course. Um, Plantronics, uh, Looker, these are just some of the companies that uh, we, are, we, are, we have graduates working in. Um, there are many other companies that are, that are around here and coming, and, and we're populating a lot of those companies. And of course, uh, the Genomics Institute has led to a number of spin-outs, uh, very important spin-outs, uh, and um, developing a, a kind of economy around uh, these genomic technologies and developing pretty much on the west side. Uh, it's becoming really a, a nexus of that kind of technology. And, and there's that tipping point, I think, in an in a, uh, in economy, in an economy, in a, in a work economy, where uh, you get enough energy in an area and things start spontaneously happening. And I think that's, that's happening here. And so just to name some of these companies, Dovetail, um, Anatomics, uh, Five Three Genomics, uh, and two two poor guys. Uh, two poor guys. We we recently have uh, uh, featured an article on them on our website, and uh, and they are they're just going gangbusters with um, with their technologies. So uh, let me just say a few words about uh, a genomics. It's a uh, it's nanopore. <laughs> yeah, nanopore. Sorry. Nanopore, yeah, to, to P-O-R-E, I'm sorry, it's P-O-R-E guys, not, yeah, they are, and, and you know, maybe they're currently poor, but uh, we, we hope that they won't be poor for long, so. Uh, two PG, okay, two PG, all right, even, even less accessible. Um, so uh, the Genomics Institute is, is clearly uh, one of the, the jewels. I guess if I was in England, I would say crown jewels. But um, it's, it's one of the jewels of, of Santa Cruz. And, and David has obviously been uh, the, the force behind the um, creation and advancement of, of this. And, and it was really, of course, one of the, the founders of the entire intellectual discipline and you know it's just a, an incredible oppor opportunity for us incredible honor for us and uh, advantage for us to have David here as part of our community and as part of the university and part of uh, the School of Engineering um, and what this this Institute really represents is something which is aligned very well with the ethos of Santa Cruz so it's about being collaborative and open and as you know uh, uh, BSOE is where the uh, human genome was first sequenced, and very importantly, it was the place where it was made public. And it was a competition with a company that was, of course, interested in in not sharing this information. And and David, in a, a remarkable feat of technology, with his uh, with his cohort uh, and his vision of um, sharing 
sharing information, sharing data, and understanding that that would lead to um, greater solutions, greater opportunities for solutions to disease, but also lead to a development of, of an industry around um, genomics by being open. And um, that publication of the human genome, first sequencing of the human genome, was an extremely important landmark uh, event in the, in the world, literally. And it happened here in Santa Cruz. So um, we're very excited about where the Genomics Institute is going and uh, its growth. It is growing and, um, you know, we're doing our part in engineering to, to foster that growth. And uh, David and I are working together to, uh, to make sure that we're, we're all positioned and aligned um, to see it succeed in the future. And in fact, we're having lunch later yeah, today <laughs> to talk about that. Uh, two meals, I don't know. <laughs> Rachel's not gonna be happy about this. Um, so that, uh, that brings me to, to Elena. Uh, Elena uh, Moritzova is um, one of the you know, prime examples of the kind of person that is attracted to the Genomics Institute and to the mission of the Genomics Institute. And uh, she is a very special person in, in our, our world up, up on the hill there. Um, Elena is a postdoctoral scholar. Uh, she is leading the Treehouse Cancer Initiative. And uh, this is, as you know, an effort to defeat childhood cancer through genomic research and sharing, in particular, of genomic data. Um, she was also selected to be the scientific lead for California Kids Cancer Comparison. Um, this is a California initiative to advance precision medicine and uh, this was recently launched by Governor Brown, um, and so uh, it's a real tribute to Elena and to the Genomics Institute. Um, she really brings a passion and a personal drive to, uh, to, this, to this enterprise and to helping, helping create lives and save, uh, save young lives. So please welcome Elena uh, Moritzova. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. Uh, it's my honor today to talk to you about our work with the Treehouse Childhood Cancer Initiative. And just brief background to the field. Unfortunately, kids do get cancer as well as adults. And in the United States, we have about 42 uh, children diagnosed with cancer every day. So that comes out to be about one in 300 boys or girls will get cancer by the time they turn 20. So it's not as rare as we may think, and actually cancer is the number one cause of death by disease in the United States. So even though both children and adult get, uh, adults get cancer, these cancers are very different, actually. The adult cancers is something we understand um, perhaps better why they happen, and they usually happen, or we think they happen, because of a combination of a degree of uh, genetic predisposition and also exposure to environmental factors such as smoking or bad diet or viruses and so on. And so um, as we age, our risk of getting cancer goes up. And so actually, if all of us live long enough, we're all gonna get cancer at some point because of these exposures to life, really. Um, so however, however, childhood cancers are very different from this. Sometimes kids are born with cancer. They get um, these cancers very early, and so this kind of idea of environmental exposure or smoking as a cause of cancer doesn't work there. And so there is something else. And so we actually think of childhood cancers as disorders of normal development or failure of the body to develop normally and developing an abnormal tumor. And uh, because of this idea that this is a disorder of normal development, incidence of pediatric cancer, childhood cancer, actually goes down with age. So as we age, we have less, less risk of developing a pediatric type of cancer, but we have a higher risk of developing an adult cancer. So uh, if you accept this idea that cancers 
are caused by DNA damage, and DNA damage is uh, really DNA mutations. I will explain what they are, but for this slide, so DNA damage due to environment equals DNA mutations, and so um, adult cancer, so based on what I said before, um, you might expect that adult cancers will have more DNA damage, more mutations, because these are older people that get those diseases. Whereas childhood cancers will not have that much damage in the form of mutations. And so, um, so at the level of the DNA or at the level of the genome, these are different diseases. What's also true is that despite being simpler and having less damage, less mutations, childhood cancers are actually much more aggressive than adult cancers and are treated much more aggressively. So current treatment paradigms um, are actually very, very devastating uh, for, for kids with cancer. Sometimes it's multiple years of treatment and it's aggressive chemotherapy, radiation therapy, bone marrow transplant. And the idea is that we try to really throw everything at these kids and hope to kill the tumor before killing the child. Um, and so because we treat these uh, diseases so aggressively, uh, once a cancer is back after that treatment, it usually comes back with a vengeance and it's usually incurable. So the devastating facts we have in the field of pediatric cancer is that like I said, once, once a tumor comes back, once a patient um, recurs, the tumor is usually incurable. And also some of the diagnoses like uh, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma or DAPG um, is incurable right at the start. So actually we have some diseases in the pediatric cancer population that don't respond to anything. They don't even respond to aggressive chemotherapies or radiation. And so in California alone, uh, we have about 400 to 500 children a year that fall into one of those two categories. Either their tumor comes back from treatment or they have a tumor like DAPG that doesn't respond to treatment. And so those children are out of treatment options. Today, we don't have anything that we could do for them. And nationwide, uh, that number is about 2,500. Um, so in California, we have about 12% of, of the nationwide pediatric cancer cases. So uh, what can we do about this? Can genomics um, help us find more treatments, better treatments for children with cancer? And you've heard that at our institute at UC Santa Cruz, uh, we have a history of uh, this genomic work for, going back to the Human Genome Project, which uh, David Steam published on the internet, and they were the first group uh, to do this. Um, so we've been thinking about genomics a lot and uh, have been applying genomics to the study. So um, how, how can genomics apply to cancer? And this is this idea of DNA damage or mutations that it talked about previously. Um, so if you think of DNA, every cell in our body has uh, DNA, and, and we were born with the same DNA in every cell, and we call that the genome. So the collective um, component of the DNA, or content of the DNA in every cell, is called the genome. And so this genome, uh, which is written in the letters A, C, T, G, so it's really just the alphabet of four letters, so this determines, or this provides instructions for how our cells and our whole body functions. And as we go through life, and as we're exposed to different things, uh, different foods, different um, environmental exposures, um, we, so this DNA can mutate, and it's basically shown here. So this is really, you can think of it as a spelling mistake. Um, letters can change into other letters. And as we go through life, this happens more and more, and so eventually, uh, we accumulate enough of these spelling mistakes, then, then the instructions change completely, and so then the cells become different from what they originally were meant to be, and this is what cancer is. It's really uncontrolled cell growth and cells becoming abnormal and just growing on their own. So this is really the cancer genomic paradigm, and in the last few years, we have seen a sequencing revolution where we now have the technologies to read these letters, so to read those genomes and understand what these spelling mistakes are. 
And so the idea is once we understand these spelling mistakes, maybe we can develop a therapy that can kill a cell that has that DNA mutation or has that spelling mistake. And so this is um, the cancer genomics paradigm. But what I have told you before is that pediatric cancers actually don't have that many spelling mistakes because they don't, they're not exposed to so much damage as adult cancers are. And so if you look at the pediatric cancer genomes, you may not be able to find um, that many mistakes. And so while this paradigm is great for adults, it doesn't really work for kids or it doesn't work for, for most kids. And uh, this, is where, this is where the drug development is because in the adults, this is, such a, this is such a concept that we understand very well and I hope this model makes sense to you that if we can find these spelling mistakes, we can make a drug and then we can apply that drug to a patient. So this is something we understand, something we can do. It doesn't work for kids, unfortunately. So what can we do for kids? And what can we do specifically in Santa Cruz? Well, you all know we don't have a medical center. Um, all we have is, is a genomics team and a lot of bioinformaticians. So um, I'd like to share with you how we got into this in the first place. So as every medical story, perhaps this started from one patient, a little boy named Kelvin. So Kelvin was an eight-year-old boy and had a very rare form of sarcoma. In fact, they couldn't diagnose the type of sarcoma that, that he had. Uh, and Kelvin uh, was treated at British Columbia Children's Hospital in Vancouver in British Columbia. And so uh, his sarcoma was profiled by DNA sequencing. So the DNA of his tumor cells uh, was read to look for these mutations. But also um, the RNA was read, and I will explain what that means. So um, these data were collected, and so the analysis that was done identified one mutation in him. So we did find, or our colleagues in Vancouver did find a mutation, but the problem was that this mutation was different from what we see in adults. And so there was no drugs, because all the drug development focuses around adult mutations, because they're common and we understand them much better. But in this case, um, so this genomic analysis was done, but for him, there was no treatment that could be suggested based on this analysis. And so it's back to square one. Even though this technology was applied, nothing we could do. And so we in Santa Cruz were privileged to, to get access to, to these data. And uh, we were able to analyze it. And specifically, we analyzed the RNA data. And I will explain what that means and how that's different. And our analysis. Um, actually suggested uh, some directions to consider um, by his team, and so uh, actually resulted in, in, in clinical success and extended his life for two years. Un unfortunately, Calvin did pass away from his disease. Um, but one thing that really um, touches me deeply and touches all of us is that um, one of Calvin's dying wishes was actually for us to use his name Kelvin, um, which is what I'm doing today. So he knew he was involved in this new research. He was very excited about it. He wanted to help and he wanted to contribute and he wanted us to use his name. So um, what is RNA and why um, it matters? Why do, why do we need to look at the RNA? So this is, this is an analogy I have. So if you think of a cookbook uh, which has instructions for how to make many different meals, and it has a lot of different recipes, but at any given time, you may only use one recipe or a couple of recipes to make something. And so um, the analogy here is that a cookbook is our DNA. So DNA in each cell has instructions for many different things, but then at any given time, you only use some of those instructions. You don't cook everything at once. And so RNA is the instructions, the recipe that you use at any given time. And then that recipe makes the product protein, which actually does its function in the cell. And so the idea is that for cancer, you can have an error at the level of the DNA or a spelling mistake in the book, but you can also have an error. So you might think that another way that your cell can be abnormal is if you um, have an abnormal amount of the RNA or 
abnormal recipe that you uh, use at any given time. So for example, you have vegetarian friends coming for dinner and you happen to cook a meat dish for them. And so that's a, that's a mistake. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so our, our, our view on pediatric cancer is what, what if we looked at the RNA? What, what if we, in, in addition to looking at the DNA and the spelling mistakes, what if we also consider the amount um, of these products that are being used in every cell? And so here is a diagram. Um, kind of the current paradigm of cancer genomic analysis is to look at the DNA from the tumor and then look at the DNA from the blood, which represents the DNA we were born with, so the original sequence and, and the tumor is the changed sequence uh, in, in the cancer and look for a mutation. And so to that, we're adding this RNA analyte that will tell us which genes are turned on in the tumor and whether the genes that are turned on are abnormal or there is too much or too little of something. And so just to illustrate how that was used in Kelvin's case, um, here I'm showing you the amount of a gene called ALK, ALK. And the significance of ALK is that there is a drug in adult cancer, so developed for lung cancer, that can uh, target this, can target uh, this protein and can kill cells that have that protein. And so here on the y-axis, we're looking at the amount of this ALK, so not DNA mutation, but just the amount, how much of ALK you have. And uh, you can see these two bars are tumors, so these are lung tumors, and these are uh, pediatric neuroblastoma tumors that respond to ALK inhibitor called crizotinib. And this is Calvin's tumor. And so you can see visually um, that this is similar to this and that and, and, and different from um, sarcomas, which are other tumors um, that in name are sarcoma. So Calvin had a sarcoma as well. And so you can see how by looking at this RNA, you can have this extra information that even though there is no mutation in, in, in ALG, but the amount of this is abnormal. And in fact, it's similar to uh, what we see in tumors that respond to this drug. So because of Kelvin, um, we, were, we were very excited and we were very honored that this analysis could actually help somebody in the clinic. And so we wanted to see whether this was a one-off anecdotal example or whether this is actually, this can actually help um, other kids. And so we asked the question, does this comparative RNA analysis, so finding genes like ALK, who, that expression is um, abnormal and similar to something else that has a drug, whether this analysis can actually produce, can help identify new treatment options for, for kids that are out of treatment options otherwise. And uh, the rationale for this and why we really focus on comparative and comparing, comparing to adult cancers is that, is that most drug development does happen in adults and we can't change that. We're not developing new drugs in Santa Cruz. That's not our expertise. But what we can help with is we can identify situations like that, like that ALK, where a rare tumor is similar enough to some adult tumor where there is a drug and that we can reposition that drug to that patient based on this additional information. And our approach is to compare each child to other cancer patients, adult and pediatric, basically as many cancer patients as we can get our hands on and then come up with these um, predictions. And of course, um, comparing the RNA space because as I mentioned, if you look at the DNA space, we often don't find anything because most of these children will not have many mutations to look at. And so what we're doing is we're really um, using big data to, f to help children whose tumors don't have adult cancer mutations. And so just to summarize what I've said is children are not little adults. The, Tumors in children are different. We need to look beyond mutations, and we specifically look at the RNA, and we look at this um, RNA sequencing derived gene expression information, and we utilize data from multiple cancer patients, both adult and pediatric, and we're looking for re relative measurements, uh, and that's why we need more data. So just briefly, I will show you some of the tools we have for this. Um, this is our tool developed by uh, Professor Josh Stewart, 
at UCSC called uh, Tumor Map. And so this is to illustrate the power of comparisons. Here, every dot represents a tumor from a cancer patient. And in this particular map, we have over 10,000 dots, over 10,000 cancer patients profiled by this approach. And you can see uh, they're laid out in this space by how similar the tumors are in this RNA space. So not the DNA, but the RNA space and then colored by the type of cancer. And so you can see breast cancers are here, neuroblastomas are here, but then you also see clusters of um, multiple colored dots. And so what it's saying, uh, even though there is a sarcoma, but it actually at the level of RNA is similar to some other tumor, and uh, which is, could be very meaningful to treatment. And just this approach is illustrated here is that you have lung cancers here in yellow, bladder cancer in, in blue, but then you might have a lung cancer that is at the level of RNA similar to a bladder cancer, and then perhaps it should be treated like a bladder cancer. Basically, this is uh, the idea. So we are growing. We have a lot of partners, including Jacobs Hard, and thank you, Lori, for supporting us throughout. Um, and we, we have partnered with, I think, nine now different hospitals that... Uh, So because, as I said, we, we're not a medical center ourselves, and we're not trying to be, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, provide this additional information to hospitals that are treating patients, and so we're partnering with everybody who will partner with us, and we're looking for more. So uh, to date, the number of patients we have, so we have presented 33 cases like Kelvin's, and we have discussed these cases in a tumor board, setting, and so what Tumor Board is, is a meeting uh, like this, really, that has a lot of oncologists and radiation specialists and now bioinformaticians that discuss each difficult case and then discuss uh, what to do for that child. And so we have presented 33 patients in this type of Tumor Board uh, setting. We have identified uh, new information in 100% of cases, so which means we have identified some potential options for a patient. So it doesn't mean we have found cures for 100%. I mean, that would be amazing. But, but we have found something to consider for 100% of the patients that we have analyzed. And that compares to less than 50% if you just look at the DNA mutation. So what we often see with DNA mutation analysis is that uh, clinicians come back and say there is nothing that mutation suggests, so there is nothing we can do. What we are saying, there is more we can consider, at least, by, by incorporating this other information. We know of four known clinical actions, which means somebody actually went and tried um, that drug in the clinic, and so far we know of two confirmed clinical responses, and we only started doing this in May of this year. So we're very excited, and of course, we want to do more. So just briefly, I know I'm probably way over time, but I just want to show you one recent case that was um, analyzed in this way, and this is a, a little boy with hepatoblastoma, a rare liver cancer. So a commercial DNA sequencing analysis test called Foundation Medicine, so this is a company that looks for DNA mutations in tumors, found that this tumor had a mutation but um, again, like in Kelvin's case, there is this mutation, but there is no drug today that can, uh, that can target this mutation. And so for this patient, it's meaningless that we know this. It's interesting from a biology point of view, but it's not clinically relevant. And so our analysis found that this pediatric hepatoblastoma was similar to an adult liver cancer. And I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm happy to talk about the details if somebody asks me later. But so uh, long story short, we found that this tumor had features of a particular type of liver cancer. And based on that, we could um, identify four different uh, therapeutic directions to consider by this tumor board team, by the clinical team. And so all of these drugs, or three of these drugs, are FDA approved already for some other indication, including one which is a diabetes drug, actually metformin approved for diabetes. And then... Um, there was also a clinical trial that we identified that this patient could go on. Um, and so, so for this patient in May of this year, we recommended for therapeutic directions that I mentioned on the previous slide to consider. Then clinician chose one of the directions, uh, uh, a drug called pazopnib, and then the disease for this child was kept at bay for a couple of months, but then progressed. 
And uh, then clinician uh, switched to our next prediction, which was ruxolitinib. Um, and now what we know is that the family moved to Oregon for um, their personal reasons, but that the child is doing well, well, and they're sending pictures of this child doing quite well. And then in January, we actually reanalyzed this case because as we get more data, we usually go back and reanalyze to see if we can learn additional information. And so that analysis strengthened our consideration for metformin, which is a diabetes drug. And we know now that the, the clinician is actually considering adding that on top of the ruxolitinib uh, because this is not a very toxic medication. So it might be possible to add that in combination to improve um, the robustness of this effect. And so we're very excited about this. And just to point out that the cl clinicians don't just go and try something we predict. So they often do validation tests. Like in this case, the clinician did do some clinically approved testing to actually verify um, that these are good directions. So what we do is we provide information and then the clinical team can follow up on this. So we're very excited and we um, are very excited and want to do more. And uh, we have a really great team now. Um, I would really like to thank all of the team members, many of whom are here, and my advisor, David Hausler, for his leadership, and Isabel Bjork, who was our program director, and she actually was the one who took this from an idea and turned this into an operation, and I'm really, really grateful to you and to all of you. And just um, one thing, I have been really kind of... Um, overwhelmed by, by this community because I think we could really only pull this off in Santa Cruz. And um, thank you, all of you, your passion and generosity and commitment to this cause.